Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about usability studies. I apologize in advance that we're doing slides, which is a little boring, um, but there's just a lot of information to convey to you that I think will work better if you've got some text in front of you. So, uh, usability studies give us a way to understand essentially how usable is our design. So, this is stuff that we've talked about just to go over it again though. Um, we want to do this because as designers we're not the users and we're going to make mistakes all the time about what we think people are going to be able to use on our site. Um, you want the actual users to be able to understand it and so if you have a feature even if you think it's great if people can't use it then you're wrong and they're right. So the users are right and you need to get them in front of the system to try it out and see if all those things that you think are easy are also easy for them. Uh, as we've discussed a bunch of times, it decreases your development costs because you find a lot of the usability problems ahead of time. You can run these usability studies on low fidelity prototypes sometimes, uh, certainly on high fidelity prototypes, um, and that includes stuff made in Envision like we did last week. And as a company, if you can catch those problems early and save yourself a lot of time, uh, that's good, obviously, in terms of both the money that you spend on development and fixing problems, but also if people can use your website, they're going to use it more effectively and uh, that'll help you make more money, hopefully. So this is something that when I teach 631, I go over, you know, kind of every week for the first month. Um, but I realized that I didn't have all of you in 631 and you may not have gotten the content in exactly this way. And so when we talk about usability, there's generally five aspects of it that we talk about measuring. Um, speed and accuracy are the first two. So um, accuracy is basically how many errors, how many mistakes do people make. And that could be typos, it could be clicking on the wrong thing, it could be going to the wrong place. Uh, speed is obviously impacted by that if you have a bunch of er errors that people make, it can slow them down. But speed also is just how long does it take to actually do the task. Maybe even without mistakes, you have to go through 20 different screens and that can take a long time. So speed and accuracy, and those are very easy to measure. You can use a timer to measure speed. And for accuracy, you can actually count the number of mistakes that people make. Learnability and memorability, I also kind of group together. And this is how easy is it to learn how to use your system. And then once you've been taught, memorability refers to how easy is it to remember how to use the system. So if I teach you and you come back six months or a year later, do you still remember how to use it? Uh, video games are really good with things like memorability. Uh, you can, once you've learned how to play a video game, you can come back and with a few little uh, attempts, you kind of remember all the features. Uh, lots of the systems at the university are terrible with memorability. I have to use them like every six months and I always have to go look up how to do it every time because I can never remember. And it's pretty, pretty easy to learn, like the instructions are straightforward but it's very hard to remember. So that's what learnability and memorability measure. And then finally there's user preference. And user preference is often different than what all these other measures would tell you. You could have a system with a feature that increases the number of errors, it slows people down, it's hard to learn, it's hard to remember how to use, and users love it. That happens a lot. Um, certainly not the majority of the time, but it is not at all uncommon. And, you know, even if it's not directly contradictory, it's really important to hear what users like and what they want to see. And if users really like a feature, it almost doesn't matter if the other things are slowed down, it's probably a good idea to include it. So we want to make the users happy. So when we're talking about usability problems with a site, I will often push you on saying which of these things is good or bad about it. And you can think back to your Hall of Fame and Hall of Shames, for example. Uh, you can think of right now you're working on the Ghostbusters project. What are things that they used, say, in the movie that you thought were unusable? And why? How does that fit with some of these five measures? And so these are a really good way to frame usability critiques that you might have about a site or an app or a device. So we talked a little bit last week about uh, ways that you can evaluate usability. On the left here, we talked about cognitive walkthroughs and heuristic evaluations. Um, on the left, there are ways that you can bring in users. You can certainly do focus groups, but what we're going to talk about today are usability tests. These are oriented around having your subjects come in, do tasks on the interface, 
and really tell you about what that user experience is like. So we call these qualitative usability studies because we're not doing like tons of measuring with them, uh, though there are some ways to gather data here. But these tend to be smaller. We're not running these with even dozens of people. You'll often run them with five, maybe 10 at the outside. Um, and the idea here is to get the user's perception of the interaction. How can they use the system? How able are they to use it? How much did they like it? And so there are a few different ways that we gather data on this. We're going to talk about each of these three different direct observation methods. Uh, simple observation, which is just like what it sounds. You watch the people. Uh, thinking aloud, where people actually have to talk through the process. And constructive interaction or co-discovery. This is usually done with two users working together to try to complete the tasks and they're able to talk to each other. Though sometimes you can run it where you as the experimenter kind of serve as the second person. And we'll talk about those in depth. Uh, there are also indirect methods. So you can do interviews, questionnaires, essentially talk to people and figure out what they liked. A good usability study is going to do all of these things. Um, you may decide that there are some direct observations you like better than others. Um, but ideally, you're going to include a little bit of each. And you'll definitely be doing interviews and questionnaires or surveys. All right, so let's talk about those three observation methods. First is direct observation or simple observation. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. The person sits down and you observe them. Uh, you don't really do anything fancy beyond that. Uh, ideally, you're going to go out to the place where the person would be actively using your system. This would be in the field. But you can also bring them into the lab. Uh, Google, for example, does a ton of in the field direct observation where they will go to people's houses. At the time, they normally would be using their computer. And they'll hang out with them in their kitchen and, uh, and watch them do what they have to do. Um, but you can really do it anywhere. And it kind of depends on where you are in the process. Uh, if you're Google and you really want to see you know, how are people using your tool in a natural environment, it makes sense to go out in the field. Uh, if you're testing something out for the first time, it's never been deployed, it may be fine to bring people into the lab to try it. Uh, for this and the other observation methods, you want to have a predetermined set of tasks that you're going to use. And we've talked about tasks in class. It's a little tricky to come up with a set of good tasks. And so you want to be prepared, have those put together. Uh, ideally, when you're running one of these, you're going to have five to seven tasks. Now, some tasks are simpler than others. So if you're at a travel website, which is what we'll use for our example here, as we've used all semester, uh, booking a flight is a pretty complicated task. There's a bunch of steps that go in there. Uh, logging in may be a really simple task. And so you can have you know, some really complicated ones, some simple ones. But you don't want to really get above seven because, as I mentioned last week, these can take a really long time to run these, these studies, uh, much longer than you think they'll take. And people will get worn out. And so if you're just giving them tons of things and testing all the little minutia of the site, uh, you're likely to lose the interest and attention of your subjects. And you don't want to do that because they're doing you a favor. Uh, Direct observation is really good at identifying big designer interface problems. And uh, as I said, there are simple observation methods. Uh, or there's three observation methods. Simple observation, where you just watch, think aloud, and constructive interaction. Before we get into those in detail, um, it's really important that you be prepared. Again, because everybody who's participating in your study is essentially doing you a favor. So you want to make sure that you pick the correct population. Ideally, these would be representative users of your system. Um, some of the other methods, it's kind of fine to have your fellow designers work with you if you're doing a cognitive walkthrough or heuristic evaluation. This one is one where you really want to try to get people as close to representative of your population as possible. And I know that that can be hard, uh, but especially if you're out doing this in industry, you want to make sure that you're selecting people who represent the skills and abilities and backgrounds of your real users. Uh, you want your tasks to be realistic and informative. One problem that I've run into, uh, I have all of my classes basically do usability studies like this. And sometimes there would be students who want to evaluate the website that they have at work, uh, and they don't like that website. And so they'll create tasks that you actually can't do on the website. You know, they'll tell you to find a piece of information or you know, to request a certain thing. And there's no way to do that on the website. 
And I think they put those on the task list because they want to prove that the site can't do it. But that's like super disrespectful of your users because all you're going to do is frustrate them and you don't actually need them to fail in order to know that it's a problem. And so you want these tasks to be realistic things that people are going to be able to do and to generally you know, pick the most prominent features of your site that people will interact with. Um, make sure you have your hardware set up. So you know, if it's an app, have it on whatever device it's on. If it's a computer, you know, have that there unless you're using the subject's computer. Uh, you may want to videotape these. I tend not to do that, but you know, I don't do really deep usability analysis uh, for a lot of my stuff. So if you want to videotape, that's cool, but make sure your equipment's all working and charged and you have all the cables and stuff, um, that your software is up and running. You don't want to be giving people buggy stuff to test because then obviously you're, that's going to mess up your results. And then you, as the facilitator, might want to have a checklist uh, so you don't forget anything. And it's important to practice, even if you're just running through everything you're going to say, kind of like a script, by yourself in an empty room. It's important to practice that so you know what to say. And ideally, if you can get a friend to just kind of listen to you say it, they'll highlight some places where your instructions may not be clear uh, or where you need to say more. So it's always good to kind of test it out beforehand. And that's true, not just for usability studies, but any study that you run. It's good to have a couple friends try it first so they can point out uh, the problems because there are always problems. Once you are ready, uh, you also will make sure you have your task list. As I said, um, you want to have about five to seven of these. They need to be straightforward, doable tasks. You want to describe these in terms of the end goals, not the features. So if someone is booking a flight, you might want to give book a flight uh, with a little more detail so they know exactly what to do. You don't want to leave it ambiguous. ambiguous. So you may say book a flight from Washington, D.C. to Chicago. Um, maybe offer the dates for that. But you want to tell them you don't want them to be told the features that they should use. So you don't want to say, click on this book a flight section and then in this box type this, right? Because then you're essentially giving them the steps to go through. A usability test is designed to help them figure that out uh, without you instructing them ahead of time. So as I said, we've talked about tasks in class. I've graded you a little bit on that. Um, but reading a lot of stuff about tasks will help you get them to the right level. As far as what it takes to do, you don't want them to be longer than five to 10 minutes. Uh, if they get longer than that, people will get distracted, they'll get bored, they'll get frustrated. And really, it would be weird if you have an app or a website that has something that takes more than 10 minutes. Like then you maybe want to rethink that process. Okay, uh, when you're recording things, um, you generally need to do that if you're going to analyze those recordings or if you're having a discussion and you want proof of what people are doing. You can rec make recordings of what's going on just with paper and pencil. You're sitting there and you're going to note stuff down. But you can also do audio and video or even screen recording. Uh, it takes a really long time to analyze that. You don't think about how hard that is until you've done it and it takes a huge amount of time. So make sure if you're going to record things that uh, you've thought about it, you've maybe tried it on yourself even. You go through, do the tasks and record it, and then see what it's like to analyze that audio or video afterwards, um, just so you know what you're in for. And don't waste your time doing it if it's just something that you're going to throw away. Okay, so those three observation methods. Uh, the simple observation method is very simple. You just stand there and watch. Um, this is also called silent observer sometimes. You don't do anything except watch them. Uh, you can't ask any questions, you can't talk to them, they don't say anything. This is most comfortable for the users because there's nothing awkward going on. They're just doing what they have to do. Um, but you don't really understand how users are making their decisions or if they're frustrated unless it's really obvious from their body language. So they may click on something and you have no idea why they did that. And in the simple observation method, you can't ask them because that's not part of the process. You could follow up in the interview and ask them, um, but you can't in the moment ask questions about what they're doing. The think aloud method is really useful for getting insights and it's also super awkward for users. So. Um, as they do this, your subjects are going to say what they're thinking and doing. So I'm going to give you a quick example of this. I'm going to flip over. Um, I have the United site up here. 
And so say my task was to pick my seats on a flight that I'm taking. Uh, so I have my trips already pulled up here and there's an option for seats. So the task is pick my seats. If I'm doing the think aloud method, I'm going to speak out loud about every action I'm taking and why. You as the observer would not say anything to me. I just have to talk kind of into the void. It's really awkward, but this is sort of what it would sound like. So if you gave me that task, I would say something like, okay, if I want to change my seats, I figure I have to click on the seats link here. So I'm going to click that. And I'm now I'm not sure if it clicked. Okay, here it comes up. Um, this is warning me that my flight is in less than 24 hours, so I can't change it. But if I wanted to, I can see that this is sort of the map here. These look like the open seats, and so I could choose either one of those, but I kind of like the one that I'm in now because I'd be by myself. And so I'm just going to leave it at that. I don't have to click anything. And to be done, I guess I want to be finished, but I'll click continue because that's on there. And now we just have to wait and see what it does. Okay, and now it's showing me my reservation, so I guess it's stuck. That's how you would do a think aloud, and it includes all those weird, awkward pauses that I had. Um, so you can see why it's a little uncomfortable as a subject to have to do that. Uh, it also alters what people will say because they don't want to look stupid, right? So if they don't know what to do, they may take a little time to silently think before they tell you what they're thinking. Um, you know, you get a lot more insight though, so maybe that's a fair trade-off. Um, it can be a little distracting, and it's interesting, in other classes, I'll give this as an assignment to actually have you all run these studies, and you'll do this a little bit in the final, but uh, I ask as an appendix to the study for you guys to analyze which of the methods that you like best. And, uh, and a lot of people say, I definitely get the best insight from the Think Aloud method. It's definitely something that's used in industry. Uh, but anyone who has had to do it, like if they're running it themselves as a subject for someone else's study, uh, admits that they don't like doing it because it's weird. So there you go. Uh, benefits and drawbacks, but it does get you good data. As the facilitator for Think Aloud, you want to support the participant. Uh, you want to support the designers and developers, and you want to accurately collect the data. Um, supporting the participant may just be telling them that they did a good job at the end, um, but you're not giving them feedback while they're doing it. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting enough information out of them that you have uh, stuff that you can take back to your design team or to the developers to really explain why people were doing what they did. And you want to make sure that you collect the most accurate data possible. Finally, there's the constructive interaction method. Uh, this is where two people get together to work on a task. So usually one of them will be the driver, they'll have the mouse, or they'll be the one tapping on the screen, but they can talk to each other about how they're going to accomplish the tasks. So it gets you a lot of the benefits of the Think Aloud method because they are talking and you kind of get to hear their process. Um, so it's less awkward, but you get a lot of that data. Um, but you know, since there's two people, you're not really getting one person struggles, right? So you're getting a little bit better than you would get with just one person doing it. Um, you can also do a variation of this called co-discovery where you have someone who's kind of a coach um, who has maybe used your website or app before and the person who's totally new to it is the one who's driving. And so that new person is going to try to do everything, but if they have questions or if they get confused, uh, they can kind of talk to the coach who's not going to tell them step by step what to do, but can kind of say, oh, maybe you should try looking at the navigation, or maybe there's an option under this thing um, to kind of get them working over there. The drawback is that you want to make sure you have a good team to do this. Um, Otherwise, you just get two people who get distracted and they don't give you any good data. Once you have had your user go through all the tasks that you've given them and using whatever observation method you've made your recordings of how it went, um, then you're going to do some debriefing. You're going to talk to them at the end. Um, Post-observation interviews are a great way to do this. As you were taking notes while they did the tasks, you should be jotting down any questions you have. Like, you know, I noticed that you really struggled to do X. Can you tell me what you were thinking there? Um, if the users have given you a diary of like previous use, you may want to go to that. Um, but here we're really focusing more on kind of in-person uh, usability tests where people may be using the system for the first time. And so you wouldn't necessarily have that diary. And similarly, if you have video footage, you may ask questions from there. Um, 
the pros and cons of this, it avoids you kind of mistakenly putting together what happened because you get to ask people about it. Um, it can take some time also, uh, but it's really valuable. So this is a step that I think you always should do. Um, you know, even if you have questionnaires and surveys, people aren't necessarily going to write down everything that they're thinking. But if you ask them, right, you just say, look, tell me what you thought of the site. Um, they're often really inclined to share that with you. And so you're going to get a lot of good data from having an interview that you won't get any other way. So to do these interviews, you want to make sure um, that you're picking the right population, that you are prepared with a central set of questions. So in the previous slide, we talked about stuff that comes up during their uh, doing of the tasks. But you also may want to have other questions to ask them about. Um, and it allows you to, as this third point says, probe more deeply on those interesting issues as they come up. Um, these interviews, when you have also pre-prepared questions, can be really good at directing what comes next in the design process. So you can get really good suggestions from people. Um, you want to make sure that you are not going to ask leading questions. And that can be tricky. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and again, like all interviews, these can be time consuming. So let's talk about leading questions. Uh, so if you had a website, if you asked, is the daily update an important feature to you? That's a leading question, right? It's hard for people to say no. Uh, subjects in all experiments want to please the person who's running the experiment. They want to give the right answer. So a better way to say that is something like, what are your thoughts about the daily update? Uh, that makes it much more likely that people are going to honestly answer. Similarly, something like, should we add support for auto-completion? Like, that's really putting in their mind that maybe auto-completion is a good idea. Instead, you could ask something like, what would you like in a tool? And if, like, literally nobody says auto-completion, it's probably not that important to them. Where if you ask the leading question, a lot of people might say yes, but not really care that much about it. So good questions are open-ended. Um, they are not yes-no questions. And they allow silence, which means people don't have to have any answer for them. So for this last example, um, should we add support for auto-completion? Like, that's not open-ended. It's a yes-no question. And you kind of have to answer. Where, what would you like in a tool? I could be like, meh, don't know, right? I don't have any thoughts for you. And that's fine. Like, it's a non-answer. And that's OK. But it just means, like, there's nothing that I especially want. Questionnaires and surveys are also really useful. Um, and again, it's good to use these in combination with having people actually carry out the tasks. Um, if you're doing that, you already have your population picked. That's going to be people who are using the tool. But you can run questionnaires and surveys as their own standalone usability analysis. If you do that, you want a whole bunch of people to do it. Um, say 50 up to a thousand subjects if you're just asking them questions about the interface. But if you're using questionnaires with people who are doing the task, then you're going to stick to your, you know, five or ten people who are doing it. Um, either way, you want to make sure you establish why you're asking the questions. You want to think about how you're going to analyze the results. Um, and then think about how you're going to deliver the survey to them. If this is something that they're doing as they're doing the usability test, um, if they're doing that with you in person, probably have it on paper so they can just fill it out when they're with you. But if it's something that they're doing separately or you're running this without tasks, um, you could do it online. Um, I guess you could do it in surface mail. Those things still exist. But that would probably be something really specific, like if you had an older population or a digitally disconnected population. Um, again, it's good to have open-ended questions so the user can answer things. Um, so you'll have a questionnaire and survey with questions that, you know, you may have uh, yes or no answers. You may have a scale. But it's also good to have open-ended questions. Uh, so similar as you would have in an interview, people can give you their own thoughts. They're less likely to fill this out in a survey uh, because it just is more of a pain to type this stuff than it is to answer it in person. Um, but it's always good to throw them in there. The worst that happens is nobody fills them out. And that's fine. Then you haven't lost anything. So pros and cons of questionnaires. Preparation can be expensive. Uh, if you're really doing a full-on survey that's going out to a lot of people, that's a tricky thing. Doing a survey well is hard. There are full semesters. There are You can get a PhD in how to design surveys. Um, so doing that well can be expensive. 
Um, now there's some pretty good software out there, but as we've actually seen, there was a Hall of Fame, Hall of Shame in class about how tools like Qualtrics can be really tricky to use. So it can take some time to put a good one together. Um, benefits, you can reach a really large population if you have one of these that just sits online, but not a ton of people are going to fill it out. You often have to pay if you want to do that. Um, if, if you send it out and you have bad questions, you're not going to get great data. So you really want to make sure you've thought about that. Um, and it can be tedious to collect uh, huge amounts of data, especially if you have open-ended questions. Um, but again, if this is something that you're using in combination with the task analysis, so you're only giving it to a few people, um, then you kind of spare yourself a lot of the cons that we're talking about here. So if you're designing a questionnaire, whether it's for five people or 500 people, um, you're going to figure out what your questions are. It's a great idea to base those on other surveys that people have published. Um, this is both methodologically good. Uh, it's expected in research that your surveys will kind of be based on well-vetted, what we call survey instruments, which are just lists of questions. Um, but you want to test your survey out with other people. Um, I do this all the time. I do lots of questionnaires and surveys, including ones that come from other people's research. And when I pilot test them, people will complain about the other surveys that have been well validated. And there will always be stuff that's unclear in mind. So it's really useful to um, debug it, no matter how many people are going to take it. Um, if you're giving it to a big group of people, not just people who are doing your tasks, uh, find a good way to get it to them, collect and analyze your data, and then establish your main findings. Um, there's a whole process to doing that, right? To doing qualitative analysis of questionnaires and surveys. We're not going to get into that today. Um, but if you're doing this, say, with a handful of people who are doing your tasks, uh, you're going to give them those questionnaires at the right point, and we'll talk about that. You're going to uh, aggregate their responses. You don't need to do a statistical analysis on that. Uh, if you have five or ten people, that's not going to be powerful enough to get you data. But you are going to be able to say these are the things that people seem to like or not um, and give those main findings from the questionnaires in addition to what you observed as they did the tasks. Just a little bit more about the kinds of questions you could put in here. Um, closed questions, these are kind of yes, no, or things with scales. Um, you give them the possible answers. These are really easy to analyze. They do limit what people are able to say, but they can give you great insights. Um, let's talk about a couple of the ways you can do that. You will probably hear this term Likert scale. I'm sure I have said it to all of you without defining what it is yet. A Likert scale is basically a numeric scale, whole numbers like this. Um, it has the endpoints labeled that kind of go from one side to the other. So hard to read, easy to read. Um, you could have happy to sad. There's all kinds of endpoints you can put on that. Um, you want to make sure you pick odd numbers. So there's one in the middle, because everybody wants like a neutral middle point. Um, people get frustrated if there's even numbers and then they're always below or above. They want to have a middle point. So pick an odd number. And generally, we see five or seven point Likert scales. Um, so this would be a five point Likert scale as the example here, because there are five options. Uh, sometimes you also see these shifted. So this one that would be five points, instead of having three be the middle, you could have zero be the middle, and then have minus one and minus two to the left, and plus one and plus two to the right. Uh, depending on what you're asking, that can make more sense to your users. You can also have multiple choice. Um, so what type of software have you used? These can be checkboxes or radio buttons, so people can pick multiple or just one. Um, think about what kind of data you want to get. So here, these are the same questions. And we have often, sometimes, and rarely, or things kind of whittled down to hours. Sometimes we really care about people's perception of how often they do things, um, and not necessarily the specific number of hours or frequency. Um, but if you really care about frequency, say you ask someone how often do you use a website, somebody may think if they use it twice a year that that's frequent. Somebody else might think you have to use it every day. So if you really want those kinds of insights, make sure to ask the question with the right answers for people to pick from so you're getting the kind of data that you need. You can also have people do ranking. And this is one that we don't see quite as often as the others. Um, 
but you could say if we have a bunch of features, say rank these in the order of what you liked best or what's most useful to you, um, and then let people actually assign them numeric rankings. Uh, that's a little bit different than rating, and it forces people to have a choice where you know maybe they think two things are pretty much equivalent. Um, but it can be useful to analyze, and if some stuff is consistently coming out at the bottom, um, or you get a really clear kind of common ranking from your subjects, uh, that's something that can help you then make usability decisions. So that's basically it. I want to take uh, one more look at the United website here, and we'll just go back to the home page again to kind of talk about how we would do this process. So if I charged you with doing a usability test on this site, uh, the first thing you would do is come up with a set of tasks. So if I were doing this, the tasks that I would have here, um, probably I would have book a flight, um, which would be a big task, but important. Uh, I would have people check the flight status, and I would give them a flight number to check the status of. Uh, I would have them do something, maybe like I did for you, with the trips that they already have planned. So it could be look at what seats they're in, um, or manage something about the flight. Um, maybe check their premiere status, which you can kind of see up here, how many miles do I have and what's my status. So that gets me four tasks. And I may come up with uh, a fifth one. Checking in is good, but they have to have a flight to actually check into. Um, so I may have them kind of compare prices or something like that. So that gives me my five tasks. I would write those down. I would ask people about them to make sure it was clear. You know, I'd have a friend try it out. So uh, those would be my tasks. The next thing I would do is put together a pretest questionnaire. Uh, so this is before people do anything, what kind of stuff do I want to know about them? That could be just simple demographic stuff, um, education level, uh, gender, income, and then the rest could depend on the site that you're doing. So if I were evaluating this site, I might ask how often people travel, how familiar are they with airline websites, um, basically to get any kind of background that I think knowing ahead of time might be useful in understanding what they do. Once I've given the pretest questionnaire, I'm going to actually sit them down with the task and have them do that, observe them with one of those observation methods that we talked about. Uh, when we're done, I might have a post-test questionnaire. Ideally, I would do that with uh, Likert scales and ask about the features that I really care about. So it could be how easy was it to book a flight? Um, how easy was it to do this thing? How frustrating was it to try whatever? How long do you feel like it took to do this task? Do you feel like you made a lot of mistakes when you were doing something else? And after each of those questions, I would also include a box to say, please tell me more. And if people fill it out, that's great. Uh, they might not, but that's OK. Uh, and then after I give the post-test questionnaire, I would sit down and do an interview to kind of debrief them. Um, I'd probably open with like, tell me about using the site. What did you like? What didn't you like? And let people talk. Some people will give you a ton of information with questions like that. Other people will say nothing. And then you want to make sure you've got other questions to really probe them about it. So you may take their post-test questionnaire and pull out any answers where, especially where they gave extreme answers, especially if they didn't like it, uh, to say, oh, it really looks like you didn't like this feature, or this thing was really frustrating. Can you tell me about that? Um, as I mentioned in the slides, you might also include questions about weird stuff that they did while you were observing them that you want to know more about. Um, and that's it. Then make sure you tell them thank you. And uh, you're going to go about processing your data, summarizing the results from all of your users, uh, and hopefully identifying what are the big problems, what are the things that are working well, and how do you change it. So that's the main idea of a usability study. Um, and I like to have them run just like that, a pretest questionnaire with background, do the tasks with an observation method, a post-test questionnaire asking about the features that I like, and, uh, and then wrapping up with an interview with pre-prepared questions, with stuff based on their answers and uh, the way they did the tasks. And generally, that will give you a really well-rounded set of insights because you'll be getting data in a bunch of ways from people. And hopefully, you'll catch all of the usability errors that you have. <laughs>